to welcome to welcome Swedasab Lipsky um, from the White Lotus Theosophical Group in Moscow. Uh, as you know, I met Sushma and I met Swedasab four years ago in Adjar. It was really wonderful um, to meet uh, meet him, and we've been in touch ever since. Um, so, as Swedasab was saying, he was born in Moscow. He graduated uh, um, in 2006 with a degree in teaching languages and has taught English in schools um, since then. In 2009, he defended a PhD thesis in pedagogy, and he's been studying the theosophical literature since 1999, and attended his first TS meeting in 2009. 2012, he was instrumental in creating a website, theosophy.ru, which is devoted to the life and works of HPB, and provides free access to the text translated into Russian. He's been a member of the Theosophical Society Adyar since 2019, a speaker and interpreter at several conferences. He's a member of the White Lotus Theosophical Group in Moscow. And in the last 10 years, the group has organized many different events, such as workshops, lectures, White Lotus Day celebrations, and, and, and additional work. Uh, so just love will be sharing his personal experience of getting to know HPB and her writings, giving some reflections on the significance of her work for the world and for us, the Osphists. So his title is, Who was HPB and how I got to know her? So we just love, lovely to have you here. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, dear friends, thank you very much for your invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to speak to my brothers and sisters in New Zealand. I think it's very good that we managed to establish and maintain this connection between our societies, and modern technologies. Well, today, day, which is tomorrow, and uh, it is a very important day for all theosophists and the ETS members in the world. We remember and pay tribute to the to founder of the TS, H.P. Blavatsky, or Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, as we say, the person who I think showed the path to many of us. I would like to share some thoughts and ideas on her role and to mention my personal experience on how I came to know her, uh, her works, uh, because we all have our own road inside the theosophical world and our individual trajectory. And through that, we relate to HPB and to the White Lotus Day. For me, the acquaintance with the theosophical literature started in 1999. Uh, then the secret doctrine came into my hands. And I believe that in Russia, it is the most well-known of the works of HPB, and I guess the most published one also. There was an edition of it that could be found in almost every big bookshop. I still have it here with me. Looks like that. And so when I opened the book, I was just carried away immediately. And when later I was thinking about it, and I had this image that it's like a, the sun among books, at least among the books that, in the bookshops that I used to visit. And I thought that if I had the second sight or clairvoyant vision, uh, and I could walk into a bookshop and to see the content of all the books or their essence or their aura through the second sight, and I could probably see the radiance coming from it and and feeling the whole room. Well, it, it was an image that came to my mind once and my impression of it, but it was later. Uh, one thing that I immediately found amazing was the way the book was written, meaning that there was nothing uh, said anywhere about why this is something that we are supposed to believe or trust or how valuable it really is, nothing about the qualifications of the author, why we should pay attention, nothing like that. So I felt it was written with a completely different attitude. And later I thought about that and thought that maybe there was a, a window of opportunity open for someone who truly knew how the world is constructed and how it works and how the human being is constructed and how human being works. And this window of opportunity was open to instruct humanity to provide the knowledge for everyone who can accept it. And so not a split second was wasted. And this window of opportunity was used fully to unveil this knowledge and to convey it to people. 
And of course, another thing that impressed me very much was the complexity of it. And when I was reading for, for the first time, I remember that sometimes I read the same page or paragraph again and again, trying to take at least something from it, not to understand it completely, because I thought, okay, this level of complexity and this depth is clearly beyond my ability to fully grasp right now. But since I was reading it and I was determined to read it from beginning to the end, I really wanted to take at least something with me from every page and from every paragraph so that when I come back to read for the second time, I would be able to deepen my understanding. It was like um, collecting material for, uh, like uh, collecting construction material and putting it on shelves for future use. Separate facts, notions, images, and then to see where uh, these pieces fit in the general picture, to try to build this huge puzzle. Uh, so uh, now, 20 years later, I sometimes joke with my friends and I, I, I laugh and say that there are still whole pieces of the text in the Sacred Doctrine, which I can read and understand nothing. <laughs> and what I mean is primarily the quotations from the Source of Measures by Preston Skinner, the book that, as you know, is often quoted. Uh, quoted a lot by HPV, and when there is a quotation from the book, usually there are numbers, numbers, then some letters and some words in Hebrew, then more numbers, then some arithmetic, and here you are, there is a conclusion. But in any way, uh, the learning process goes on, and that's how my introduction to HPV and her works happened originally. Then somewhere around uh, 2004, in one small bookshop in Moscow, I found a small soft cover book, which was secondhand and had a very small price. It was The Voice of the Silence and The Light on the Path in one book. And I felt somehow attracted to it and I bought it. It's also still here, very, very worn out, but uh, kind of an important book for me. And um, so I was carrying it with me uh, in the inner pocket of my winter coat for some time in my bag. And I was reading and rereading it. And it felt like it was very, very deep and somehow very soothing when I was reading it. And it gave me this feeling of peace. And um, it had some level of philosophical abstraction uh, and metaphysical depth. So it, it helped me to move away from my mundane life, from everyday experience, from running around, doing things. And there was some level of peace that I was able to reach just by opening the book and starting to read it. Then in uh, uh, around 2009 and 2010, I started reading more articles by HPB. I have a friend, a theosophist, who was responsible for editing the translations of HPB's articles in a publishing house in Moscow where she used to work. And that publishing house published two large collections of articles and several volumes each. One collection is called The White Lotus and the other one is called HPB's Message to Posterity. And the first series was arranged chronologically, and the second one, uh, the articles were grouped by the main theme. So the, mostly the same articles, just grouped in different ways. And starting about 2009, I started studying the articles more than before, and read most of them with, with time. And in 2012, as Simon mentioned also in, in the introduction, I started creating a small website in Russian called Theosophist.ru. And I worked on it for some time to try and present the, all the works of HPV translated into Russian um, for everyone to be available freely, to be downloaded anytime. Uh, of course, the collection is far from complete on the site, but uh, it has the main things there. And sometimes there are also links to the English version of the text and some other things like biography materials of HPV and so on. So um, speaking about the articles, I think they uh, really present an inexhaustible source for study. They cover such a range of topics that you can find almost anything there, touched or commented somehow by HPV and sometimes by other writers. She has some, some things even about uh, epidemic 
uh, which was very, very relevant uh, very recently. And, um, well, all sorts of topics. And uh, so in, I think we also may be very grateful to HPB's relative, grand nephew, Boris Tsirkov, who spent decades uh, collecting her articles for us. In 2020, when the pandemic started and everybody went to Zoom, you know, we also started some theosophical activities online in Russia, and my theosophical life became much more intensive. Uh, so today we study the articles of HPB, we arrange lectures on different theosophical topics. Uh, every Saturday, there is a group studying the secret doctrine, there are round tables, and some other things. And of course, the cooperation between cities uh, is very much increased because of, uh, you know, everybody using uh, video conference capacities. Uh, and um, also, we meet a lot of wonderful friends from abroad, especially last Saturday of each month, we invite a foreign speaker. And so one Simon gave a talk to our community, which was very well received. So th that's a bit of the history of my personal experience. And uh, my path in the field of theosophical literature over the course of years, some kind of main landmarks. Um, and I think that HPV for me has been the main focus in my theosophical studies and in the, the main source of inspiration for me to, to learn more. Speaking about the role of HPV and her influence, again, from my personal experience, I would like to mention some aspects of it that seem interesting and important to me. I think over the course of these years, I get re really used to her mental presence, so to say, or to this mental content of her thoughts and ideas. And also I get constantly exposed to her language, her manner and style of expressing herself. I read in English and in Russian, and uh, it feels to me that it produces a rather significant change in you over time. I mean that on the level of ideas, uh, I think it's clear that we learn from, from her ratings and that maybe is the intellectual component of it. Also on some level of psychic or spiritual presence, of course, there is a certain communication between the reader and the writer. And when we read and study, I think we establish this link, this connection between us and HPB and also those who directly participated sometimes in the creation of her texts, meaning the masters of wisdom. Uh, so that's a certain influence on the inner level. But also I think it's interesting that there is a certain influence on the level of language. I believe that her language has some really highly developed qualities that are hard to find in other places and in other literature sources. And that's because of who she was, I think, an adept. Um, I think she described it somewhere, um, not a full adept. That's how she referred to herself, I believe. But in any way, she was an initiate who stepped on the next level of development, and it was naturally reflected in her thinking and in her language. For example, it seems to me that uh, she is always capable of expressing the point of what she was trying to say very, very clearly to pinpoint the exact meaning. And I think it is a quality that is hard to find elsewhere. It may be connected with this ability of uh, controlling one's mind and, and knowing yourself so much that your attention doesn't deviate from the object, from the idea that you keep in, your, in the focus and wish to express. So I think um, studying works for for a considerable amount of time, we may first develop a taste for the thinking and for the language of a higher quality, and then start developing these qualities and abilities of thinking and speaking in ourselves, well, within our capacity. Um, of course, nothing is perfect. And speaking about HPB, sometimes we can find some criticism to her writings in the Mahatma letters. And of course, we also have the examples of their language and their thinking to compare. And also other references we can make, of course, for instance, Subarao who, um, and the things he wrote. And Subarao was not only a very advanced cello, but also a lawyer. And that may be one of the reasons why his writings um, are often very well structured. 
in one place in the Theosophist, for example, we can find that it should be commence a text uh, from one Indian Swami. And she finishes her comment saying, and now we must leave the uh, venerable Swami and his views to the dissecting knife of Mr. Subarau. Uh, so um, I think it, this metaphor highlights the qualities of Subarau's language and thinking. But regardless of all that, uh, it seems to me that HPP's language does have this superior qualities, uh, which are rare to find. And so drinking from that source for a long time and uh, so to say, growing together with it, it can be very beneficial for all who read her works. Another aspect is the creation of the picture of the world in our mind as we gain new understanding in the Jnana process. When we read the theosophical literature, we always try to create a more perfect vision of the world in our mind. I think uh, all theosophists who study the theosophical writings engage in, in this process of Jnana development. And it is um, well explained in the small article by Bowen um, when he asked so, certain questions to Ishwabi um, not uh, long before her passing away and she she shows how uh, and how this picture of the world that we create we uh, constantly uh, well it it's it stops uh, satisfying us at some point and we learn some new things some new facts some new no notions and we have to abandon the previous picture it starts to um, uh, to crumble and we recreate it in a better way and it happens until we come to to from the level of concrete mind to the level of abstract mind so this is a constant process and thanks to hpb we can we have a chance to expand our view and to to see how magnif magnificent our world is and here of course i remember one moment in Mahat in the mahatma letters um, where H, where KH refers to the earth as a speck of mud in space. And so <laughs> I suppose for an adept, it must be a spot of mud, uh, or a, like a speck in the grand structure of, of the solar system, of our solar cosmos. But for us, I think uh, it's a whole world. And in our experience in a normal education system, at least, well, speaking for myself, and I suppose it may be similar in other places in the world also, well, the, the scope of vision that we get of our world is very limited. In terms of geography, we mostly focus on the geography of those places and countries which have significant economic and political influence and maybe some cultural influence today. When I studied the English language in the university, we had a course in American uh, and English history and geography. Uh, so America and, and England, uh, but somehow we didn't study New Zealand history and geography. But uh, if I'm um, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm mistaken. New Zealand is a part of Lemuria, uh, which makes it very important historically. But we are not taught that in our system of education. In geography lessons, we were not told about the Easter Island and the ruins of South America, for example and the great many monuments of the past but they are all very important it is our true and very ancient history and it's not just history because from them we can learn some symbolism and some system of beliefs of our ancient society and with time we can learn some of their wisdom also so it's important so if we think about all these things which hpb describes um, the scope of our thinking in terms of geography and history uh, widens and more things can be accommodated in the within the framework of our inner picture of the world and we don't get that in our education system again um, speaking about history we usually uh, speak about recent centuries maybe 2000 years and beyond it everything is uh, well becomes vaguer and vaguer and dimmer and dimmer and then disappears in in the darkness of the unknown but HPB gives us the expanse of, let's say, 18 million years. Of course, we don't know much about the history of those early periods, 
but there are some key elements of the world as it then existed which are given in each of his works especially maybe in the secret doctrine and it gives this expanse to our mental picture of the world and it also shows some important landmarks for us to try and correctly interpret uh, the knowledge that we can gain from other sources like the great indian epics from ayan and mahabharata for example they also speak about the events of our ancient times so not even considering maybe the most important aspect the metaphysical aspect of it um, we may simply say maybe that to to accommodate in our mind the events described there as a part of our ancient history we have to have this wide picture of the world or we will not be able to do it and we will end up depreciating this ancient knowledge and rejecting this ancient knowledge as fairy tales just as the materialistic science does and so we will not be able to learn from them so here Hishwabi's works and the results of her lifelong uh, uh, effort to gain knowledge and to share it with us can be seen as training for us that is necessary to be able to keep learning from other important sources of um, of deep knowledge and i mentioned the geographical and historical aspects as examples uh, they have their role i think in the jnana process that we all engage in because the uh, expanse of space and time that we hold in our mind is like the size of the framework within which we create our picture of the world and as we learn we try to accommodate in the, in it some great things like magic all kinds of power of nature and human being that are inherent in us um, the true composition of the human being some things about the uh, structure of the solar system and the intelligences that guide the planets all the great things that we try to understand and we would not be able to fit them inside a small box Mm, we would not have space in our mind for things like coming of avatars, change of yugas, the cataclysms that happen both on the social level and geographical levels, and many other great things. So um, I think it's important. And where else um, can we get such a grand view, such a training today, other than in the theosophical literature? And I think it seems to me especially in hb's writings another aspect of which this influence is of course the example of your life and it is a great example i think all could refer to to her uh, somewhere as a larger than life personality so <laughs> she she traveled so much in her life uh, you know uh, i believe she went three times around the globe uh, in those days in the 19th century traveling was quite a different experience obviously much more difficult much slower uh, so what didn't she see in the world and what didn't she try she traveled across the expanse of eurasia different continents penetrated tibet you name it uh, she she fought in the battle she gave piano concerts she took part in horse races and so her, her biography is a marvelous reading itself i think and of course, everywhere she went, she learned from representatives of all kinds of esoteric traditions. And as we know, um, especially later in her life, she gave everything she had, her whole time, her whole energy to the mission and to her mission. And especially maybe it started to develop when she met her master uh, in London for the first time when she was 20 and uh, um, speaking about the role of hpb and her influence to our world in general uh, we know from the mahatma letters that they have been looking for her uh, or better to say for someone to perform that mission for about 100 years and that shows of course how important that mission of hers was and the main meaning of this mission is explained in the Mahachohan's letter, I believe, that speaks about the role of the Theosophical Society in general. But it is also true about the role of HPB, who was the founder of TS and who gave her life and all her work to it. So um, 
the letter explains that there were two deadly tendencies in the 19th century which were absorbing the thinking minds of humanity, especially in the West. Uh, the thinking minds that were trying to understand something about life and that were asking main philosophical questions like what is a human being, what is life, and so on. So those minds had only basically two choices, either um, materialistic science or um, dogmatic religion system of belief. And so Mahachokhan's letter uh, refers to it as degrading superstition and still more degrading brutal materialism. And the rest of the society would follow those th thinking minds because that's how human consciousness works on the social level, I believe. And also the letter says mm, those intellectual classes reacting upon uh, ignorant masses which they attract and which look up to them as noble and fit examples to follow, degrade and morally ruin those they ought to protect and guide. So I believe we can say that um, also there was a third alternative that was attracting a lot of attention from thinking minds, a very dangerous one, uh, sp spiritualism. Um, uh, so the theosophical literature and the theosophical society were not there yet in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century. And so the ideas that they bring were not available for people at that time. But there were a lot of spiritualistic phenomena happening in the 19th century uh, all over the world. And those phenomena were done without proper knowledge. And maybe we may say maybe that 95% of all the phenomena that were genuine, not, not a fraud, were basically just necromancy and terribly damaging to the mediums and also to some poor disincarnated human beings who were spending their time on the subtle plane um, after leaving their bodies before time uh, and um, uh, not having reached the Vachan yet. So th those uh, spirits, as they are ex um, called in Mahatma letters, they were attracted uh, to the seances, to the mediums, and it was very, very damaging, very harmful for them also. So then it had to be somehow stopped because it was a real epidemic those days. And the powers that people used, uh, maybe they were not a problem themselves, I think, but the use of those powers without proper knowledge was a big problem. And some correct theory had to be explained to become the foundation for the right philosophy uh, to guide the actions of spiritualists. Maris Tsirkov um, gave a talk in 1975 that was titled, The Light That Never Fails. Like he said this, uh, in thinking of the three chief founders of the modern Theosophical Society, Blavatsky, Olcott, and Judge, it would not be out of line to look upon them and their combined work as a wedge thrust with both knowledge and power into the fabric of accidental materialism, an effort which resulted in the opening of opening up of new channels for human thought and made it possible for others to continue their work and enlarge upon it. So um, expanding a little bit this, this idea and speaking about HPB, uh, I think we can say that <clears throat> her work was a, a, a wedge driven into the fabric of ignorance in shape of blind materialism, religious dogmatism, and maybe also spiritualism of those days breaking some free way for thinking and searching minds. And there is another significant factor that I would like to mention here at the beginning of a new cycle. Um, HPB wrote that at the end of the 19th century, she, she mentioned specifically 1897, the first 5,000 year uh, long cycle of Kali Yuga <coughs> uh, had to end and it would bring a very significant change to human mentality and create new conditions for people to to live and to develop in so um, um that also required a lot of attention and right philosophy and right ideas that that would 
that would uh, saturate the mentality of those days and help people to 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 come to terms of these new conditions and to develop successfully uh, in 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 the new environment so these things had to be somehow addressed <clears throat> and worked with and some knowledge had to be given to the thinking portion of humanity of the west especially and there is another quotation from the key to theosophy um which mentions these things and it also mentions the creation of brotherhood another very important uh, task or mission that was undertaken and this really speaks about the ts in general but i believe it is fully applicable to the essence of her work and her mission uh, it says it will gradually leaven and permeate the great mass of thinking and intelligent people with its large-minded and noble ideas of religion, duty, and philanthropy. Slowly but surely, it will burst asunder the iron fetters of creeds and dogmas, of social and caste prejudices. It will break down racial and national antipathies and barriers, and will open the way to the practical realization of the brotherhood of all men. Through its teaching, uh, through the philosophy which it has rendered accessible and intelligible um, to the modern mind, the West will learn to understand and appreciate the East at its true value. Further, the development of the psychic powers and faculties, the premonitory symptoms of which are already visible in America, will proceed healthily and normally. Mankind will be saved from the terrible dangers, both mental and bodily, which are inevitable when that unfolding takes place, as it threatens to do in a hot bed of selfishness and evil passions. Man's mental and psychic growth will proceed in harmony with his moral improvement. So, um, we can ask ourselves, and I think we do ask ourselves sometimes, how did it go? How successful uh, has this work been so far? And some interesting answers can be found in the in the writings of HPB. Uh, first, of course, in the preliminary memorandum of esoteric instructions, she writes, the Theosophical Society has just entered upon the 14th year of its existence. And it, if it has accomplished great, one almost say stupendous results on the exoteric and utilitarian plane, it has proved a dead failure on all those points which rank foremost among the objects of its original establishment. Thus, a universal, as a universal brotherhood, or even as a fraternity, one among many, it has descended to the level of all those societies whose pretensions are great, but whose names are simply masks nay, even shams. Nor can the excuse be pleaded that it was led into such an undignified course, owing to its having been impeded in its natural development and almost extinguished by reason of the conspiracies of its enemies <clears throat> openly begun in 1884. So we see here that there is a lot of work to be done for us still. And of course, the problems mentioned before also i think blind materialism dogmatism superstition they're still here today but i would presume thinking about it that they do not block the development of humanity anymore not like it was in the 19th century although i suppose they still hinder it uh, um, uh, so uh, there has been a significant change in mentality i think of of our humanity and the ideas given by the Theosophical movement, given by uh, through Theosophical writings and the work of HPB, uh, certainly help our evolutionary progress. Uh, so, mm, in the Secret Doctrine, HPB writes, Every century an attempt is being made to show the world that occultism is no vain superstition. Once the door permitted to be kept a little ajar, it will be opened wider with every new century. The times are ripe for a more serious knowledge than hitherto permitted, though still very limited so far. So it shows that um, this work never stops and the results, uh, some results are always achieved inevitably and they cannot be taken away. So the, 
the mentality of uh, human race changes inevitably. And um, there is another interesting quotation. I, I find it very interesting <coughs> about the future. In the third volume of the Secret Doctrine, it should be writes about the 21st century. She says, the vindication of the occultists and their archaic science is working itself slowly but steadily into the very heart of society, hourly, daily, and yearly, in the shape of two monster branches, two stray offshoots of the trunk of magic, spiritualism and the Roman church. Fact works its way very often through fiction, like an immense bow constrictor, era in every shape encircles mankind, trying to smother in her deadly coils every aspiration towards truth and light. But Era is powerful only on the surface, prevented as, as she is by occult nature from going any deeper. For the same occult nature encircles the whole globe in every direction, leaving not even the darkest corner unvisited. And whether by phenomenon or by miracle, by spirit hook or bishop's crook, occultism must win the day before the present era reaches Shani's, Saturn's triple centenary of the Western cycle in Europe. In other words, before the end of the 21st century AD. So, of course, I would really like to know what it means exactly, but apparently <laughs> I think it's clear that it's going to be a very, very interesting century because occultism must win the day um, before the century ends. So uh, also in uh, Maha Mahachokhan's letter, we read that the Theosophical Society was chosen as the cornerstone, the foundation of the future religion of humanity. And the work of HPV was, uh, well, uh, um, maybe the main uh, um, contribution for creating the, the basis of knowledge for it, maybe. <clears throat> so it's uh, indeed very significant. And, um, well, I think that the work once started by a certain teacher uh, never ends. As it, uh, they say about teachers in general, that a teacher uh, influences eternity. They can never say where their influence ends. And it's also true about HPB. And also, I think that um, there is a uh, very special connection between the uh, guru and the chala, or a teacher and a student, as in our case, in case of, of HPB, because we all learn from her. And other writers that we read within the theosophical literature tradition also uh, read HPB and also uh, learned from her. So this is a, a whole system uh, of knowledge uh, somehow passed through HPB and given by HPB. So um, karmically speaking, there is a connection between us, us and, and Helena Blavatsky. And as long as we uh, learn and make effort, and as long as we haven't achieved the position of teacher ourselves, there is a certain responsibility for us and for our actions and for our development that I think it should be bears. So um, <clears throat> it's very possible that um, theosophists in the world uh, can sometimes give some inspiration from, from HPB, from the masters maybe also. And uh, um, Especially, I think it's true for the groups of theosophists who managed to create a small example of brotherhood, working together and keeping together. And especially among those who actually try to do something to help humanity to be useful. And this may be a, a necessary condition to receive this inspiration and this guidance. Uh, so, um, well, um, I think looking at the world and looking at the theosophical history, I, I think we see that um, a lot has been done. Uh, this tendency, this cyclic return that HPB is writing about, this cyclic return to, to mystical thinking, there is, there is another very interesting quotation about it. Um, 
uh, really changed a lot the mentality of our times. And we can see it in everything. We can see it in literature. We can see it in movies and books. In everything that that uh, young generations are interested in. Uh, if 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 we look at, um, for example, the cartoons that people watch, I always it always came um, comes to my mind when I read about these things. Especially two examples: one for uh, one uh, Japanese anime, hugely popular for girls and one Japanese anime hugely popular for boys, the first called um, Sailor Moon and the second one called Naruto. They are everywhere, you know, everybody knows them. And there are so many esoteric things there. Well, there is a very, very long list. They basically show magic and some esoteric things, some powers that human being has. And for young generation, it's, um, well, for several generations now, I think, it's not um, it's not uh, any uh, any anything new uh, it's um, it's something that they are familiar with it's a concept that they are used to uh, even if they don't see these things happening in the, in the life around them but they keep it inside them as a possibility and maybe as the uh, amount of this of these ideas grow in in the mentality of our humanity uh one day it will reach some critical mass some critical point and it will spill into real life well that's just my attempt to understand basically the quotation of uh, the the phrase of which would be that occultism should somehow prevail in the in the in the 21st century and that this psychic uh return to mystical thinking has come to us and we should should we should be prepared Um, so, um, there is a lot of work to be done yet, especially as HPB points out in, in the direction of building the brotherhood, because I think uh, when we study things and we get to un understand the world and ourselves better, it's very, very precious, of course, but <clears throat> I believe that maybe when we um, accumulate facts, accumulate some knowledge, uh, we use the capacity of our memory and then when we uh, work with these facts and pieces of the puzzle trying to arrange them trying to fit them in the general picture we use the capacity of our intellect to to play with facts but the question is how to how to arrange these pieces these facts correctly so that it's uh, actually true to the real state of things and uh, so where, where does this ability come from? People can be very intelligent. They can have a whole, uh, I don't know, British library in their, in, the, in their head, in their memory, but they may be very far away from, from, uh, from wisdom, from the true uh, understanding of things. And especially some examples come to mind of many scientists, many prominent scientists of the 19th century that they should be quoted often and also criticized sometimes. So, um, what is it that gives us this this ability to to arrange the the facts that we learn correctly? I think it comes not from our concrete mind, but from higher levels. Maybe from our true self, our buddhimanas. Maybe from our buddhi nature. So, and uh, if if that is so, if these emanations that we are able to catch sometimes, these insights that we are able to get sometimes, is something that that is the most precious for us, because it's better to have fewer facts but arranged well than a lot of facts and <clears throat> being incapable of uh, building the, the correct picture, the correct view, then uh, the most important thing for us is not um, so much, you know, intellect so much knowledge which is of course very important but the maybe the pure life the, the the virtue the virtuous behavior and high moral standards and as hpb explains in one place um altruism is the great practice that helps us to to cleanse the the shells the veils the the screens of our soul so we can we start seeing uh, seeing clearly and on on that path 
working to create brotherhood is the main thing because it means overcoming our ego and uh, growing together, receiving a lot of magnificent opportunities for future development and for helping helping humanity. So um, let's carry on the torch. And um, sometimes I think that to imagine what our world would be like and what our lives would be like if there was no initiative of the great hierarchy in the 19th century <clears throat> to create the Theosophical Society and to start the Theosophical Movement, and then, well, I don't even want to try to imagine, really. And uh, I want to finish with a quotation that is um, ascribed to Ishvavi. It's not clearly known, and there are some, some opinions, but it was found, I think, in her, in her writings and published after her passing away. And I like it very, very much. Uh, it says, there is a road, steep and thorny, beset with perils of every kind, but yet a road, and it leads to the very heart of the universe. I can tell you how to find those who will show you the secret gateway that opens inward only and closes fast behind the neophyte forevermore. There is no danger that dauntless courage cannot conquer there is no trial that spotless purity cannot pass through. There is no difficulty that strong intellect cannot surmount. For those who win onwards, there is a reward past all telling, the power to bless and save humanity. For those who fail, there are other lives in which success may come. So today, let us send our love, respect and gratitude to the great being that we know as HVB. And thank you very much. It's very good to be able to speak to my brothers and sisters from New Zealand and spend this time together. Thank you. Simon, your microphone. Thank you, sweetest love. Fantastic. Great. Um, thank you. Yeah, really, really nice. So um, before I open it up for any questions, I'll just point out we've got... Um, Isis, who's going to be speaking to us tomorrow. She's up very late because it's quarter to three in the morning in Brazil. So, hey, Isis. so welcome, Isis. Thank you very much to have you here. This was the one who introduced us in a year. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Um, okay, so questions, thoughts for sort of love. <coughs> Louise. Um Oh, am I on mute? No, no, you're good. You, you were before. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, that has given me that. I, I loved that. Thank you so much. I, um, okay. I want to make sure I've got everything um, <clears throat> clear in my mind. I really loved the reference at the beginning to the long-term energy of the classic books, um, Secret Doctrine, Voice That Sound That's Light on the Path, and and the language of HPB, and that being different to the Mahatma letters language, and then Subaru's more structured writing. Um, I feel this is important because how things are expressed are often how they are received. Yeah. And um, I just, I hadn't thought of that before. So it just sort of has opened um, a window for me um, when I um, revisit those works. Um, and then uh, you, uh, you know, the Mahatma letters in there, speck of dust in our view is limited. Um, and uh, the creation of the picture in our mind, um, along with HPB's larger than life personality. And, and we've got the personality, but we've got the, the, the big picture. Um, oh, I've got so much to play with here. And then there was this some... Um, uh, the accumulation of knowledge and how we use memory and intellect to play with facts um, and how to use these powers. It's sort of not when it's appropriate. It's, well, it, well, it is, it's when it's appropriate. It's not what is appropriate. Um, when and, um, and the, to explore collaborative, rather than competitively 
um, the connection of the head and the heart and integrity, connection between the teacher and student, and that when we read the literature, that connection, which I hadn't thought of before. Um, and, um, and then you said, I think your words are a system of knowledge where we're karmically connected, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, and then the, the whole idea of truth, which is, you know, the, the soft society, no higher religion than truth, is actually the cleansing and seeing clearly and, you know, that true integrity behind the veil. So uh, that's all I've taken away from that. I'm just so excited. I just feel like I just want to revisit all those books. I think I really loved the way that you presented it. Um, I know that's pretty hard time in Russia right now, so I hope that you're doing okay. And, thank you. Um, Everything is fine. Thank you. Good, great. And yeah, no, thank you so much for giving your time. I, I found it really inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Um, oh, am I unmuted? I am. No, you're good. You're good. Yeah, okay. Oh, Sv uh, Svita's love. That was very inspiring. I've just loved listening to you and reiterating a little on um, what Louise has just said. I just loved loved it when you mentioned the aura that you imagined to be around the book of the secret doctrine. It's not something I had thought of before, and a picture of that in my mind is quite lovely. It is a sacred book. Of course, there's an aura around it. And what I felt when you were speaking, which comes across so strongly and so sincerely, is this connection that you feel and you felt it through connecting with the energy of the writer and that touches on something that's quite close to my heart and always has been I have always um, found a great deal of joy in, re in reading the old language it takes a little bit more effort but when we do that, when we read these teachings in the original language that HPB used, I think that's how we connect with her energy. And although it can be easier sometimes to look at some of these concepts put forward by in a more contemporary kind of uh, fashion, that contemporary interpretation, to my mind, is never going to carry quite the same depth and richness of the original words. So um, I love that you mentioned that because it's something that, um, you know, that's quite important to me too. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your journey of inspiration because that is in turn inspiring for those, those of us who are listening to you speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay, before I take another question, I have a couple of comments, and particularly relating to what uh, Chris was just saying, Suresh Lavis from Susanna. What a heartfelt talk. Thank you so much. You mentioned the books, the volumes by HPB containing an energy. Absolutely agree. Just having them close imparts the essence, the intention. Um, also from Annie, thank you, Swedish Love, for the brilliant, insightful decoding of HPB, her mind, her works, and her mission. Okay, um, anyone else? Um, Swedish Love, I'll say thanks. Fantastic. It's interesting in terms of, you know, that change um, in the consciousness of humanity in the last 140 years four years, 43 years, 44 years since the formation of the society. It's interesting. The Mahatmas had to get permission from their bosses to actually start the society. It's fascinating because they argued the case that humanity needed it. Um, you know, those intellectual classes that needed more than spiritual and more than religion. And where would we be without the TS? You know, um, yeah. it's been part of our lives. So fascinating that they got the go-ahead, even though at one level this, it was an experiment and it's failed. At another level, it's been a success. 
you read yes. stuff in common movies and stuff, bad karma and all the rest of it. All of this teaching is out there. And um, it's hard to imagine it because you never know what the counterfactual is if it had not happened, what the world would be like without mm. this knowledge in the West publicly. So really, really good. Thanks. Uh, Sushma. Um, I have a question for Svetoslav. Have you had a chance to read uh, HPB's articles that she used to send to Russian periodicals and things in Russian and the original? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, she she wrote some articles when she stayed in New York uh, in American period. Uh, she wrote to there was this uh, newspaper called Pravda, the Truth. I think it's from the city of Odessa, uh, and um, well, they are satirical. She she really um, you know highlights the pecul peculiarities of American lifestyle and some weird things. Well, it's a it's a it's a lot of fun for I, I'm I, I imagine it's a lot of fun for people to read who stayed in uh, in Russia uh, and who read those materials in Russia. Then uh, I believe the caves and dungeons of 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 Hindustan were written originally in Russian also for, for yes to be sent to to Russia to to be published in in magazines. That's another example. And another example is, of course, some letters, some letters that she wrote to to her relatives and some friends uh, in Russian. Yes, yes, I, I read them. The language is very interesting, uh, as um, as was mentioned just now. It's an old style language, not only English but Russian also. So reading it, it it's really, but it's a like a reading good literature of 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 the nineteenth century. Thank you. I've always been curious about how she would sound in Russian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else got any comments, thoughts for Swedislav? We're all stunned. It's fantastic, yeah. Swedislav. Great. It's great. Really great. We are. We're all sitting here. Um, I don't know. There's there's a particular energy that's being created um, that's kind of left us a bit in awe. I don't know how else to what what the right words are to describe it, but um, it's just lovely to finish on this note quietly and um, bask in this lovely energy that I feel that we've experienced listening to this talk. You are very kind. Thank you very much. And when I was preparing, I felt very, very easy, you know, very, very calm before coming here. Not nervous at all before speaking because I somehow anticipated a very friendly atmosphere. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, then uh, a special vote of thanks. Thank you, Swedish Love. Really, really good. Um,